Hello, this is Photography Gamer. Welcome back to the channel. So today I am covering the Virtual Photographer's Guide. Thank you to everyone who watched the previous episode focusing on God of War. In today's episode, I'm going to be looking at the photo mode in Ghost of Tsushima and I'll be breaking down the game's various photo mode functions. Following this, I'll delve into the episode's special topic, focus and depth of field. And I'll wrap up the episode with some questions I've received from the virtual photography community. Okay, so Ghost of Tsushima. Well, it's a very, very beautiful game. It's a game I've really been experimenting with for the last few weeks. Very colorful, and the photo mode's got some very unique functions that I haven't seen in other games, so I'm gonna break down each one individually, so let's get into it. Right, basic functions. First and foremost, you can use the L2 and R2 for craning. Craning is raising the camera up or lowering the camera. Low, low to high shots generally create a sense of epic scale. High to low are good for kind of like panoramic type shots. Then we have the tracking shot feature, which basically you can choose a position for your camera, then you can save that and then choose another bullet point next to it. And you can do a whole bunch of them next to each other in a line. And then what will happen is it will be like a, a motion from the first camera position to the last. So it's good if you want to create a kind of a cinematic kind of panning shot. Next, we have focal length. Focal length, you think of it like an artificial zoom or zoom out. However, when you do zoom out to the absolute maximum, it kind of creates a barrel distortion on the image, like a sort of fisheye lens, like a curvature to what you're looking at. But I use it generally if I want to sort of close in the framing to kind of without having to move the joysticks. Then you have roll. Roll is a good way of just kind of tilting the image one way or the other. It's a good way of emphasizing action shots, combat shots, or just creating a kind of an eerie sense if you want to just have things a little bit off kilter. Next we have depth of field. Now the f-stop range on this is crazy from an incredibly high number down to f-stop 1.4. If you don't know what f-stops are, it's how the, the depth of field is measured. So the bigger the f-stop number, the more of the image will be in focus. The lower the f-stop number, the more narrow the focus area will be, which will mean there'll be more blur in the foreground or the background. Next, we have focus distance. So you, thankfully you can auto focus, which is really handy because we don't always wanna to have to do that manually, but you can do it manually and switch it with the square button. Next, we have color grading, which is basically filters. So we've got various different colored filters which you can use to kind of give your image a nice sort of split toned effect. And there's some really nice, there's some nice variety here. And you can use the next screen, the color grading intensity in a percentage terms to kind of impact how much of a severity you want of that color. So if you've got a colorful image, but you want to take the color out a little bit, you can then just put a black and white filter on it and then just drop the percentage number down to about 15% or something like that. So you'll have about 15% of black and white on top of your color image. That will counterbalance it, desaturating it a little bit. Next, exposure bias. That's basically, think of that as just brightening or darkening the image. So it's if you've got an image that's particularly dark and you want to just bump it up a little bit or vice versa, that's a nice tool. Use that in conjunction with the color grading can cause some nice effects. Okay, now we're getting into the sort of interesting new features. So particles, so there's a whole lot of them. You can add leaves, cherry blossom, birds, fireflies, embers, crows, a few other things. Now, some of them look good. Some of them look a bit ridiculous and like the volume of stuff on the screen is crazy. So thankfully you have particle intensity much similar to color grading intensity. So you start with 100% and you just drop it down to a level that suits what you want. You know, obviously on 100%, it's like someone's just taken a bag of leaves and chucked them on the screen. So it's a bit silly. So you just need to tweak that until you find the right balance for you. Next, we have wind speed and wind direction. So wind speed, it's self-explanatory. When you're doing the photos, the environment looks animated. So the wind will dictate which way the trees, the grass, various things are flowing, including the leaves. So the speed will dictate, you know, how severe things are moving. The direction is what angle. 
and that might seem like a super like a bonus you don't really need but when you know sometimes things can be in front of your subjects if you change the wind direction they will be out of the way so it's a good thing to play around with and it's got some nice uh, implemented effects there next we have clouds which you can move so you basically as you see here you can pan the clouds across the sky until you've got the nice kind of cloud you want if you've got the clouds in the shot time of day well time of day you change the time of day so you're gonna if it's daytime it's gonna be bright nighttime it's gonna be dark but it's not just the light and the dark that changes it's the temperature the color temperature the ambient temperature that changes sunset everything goes golden nighttime it's bluey green during the day it's kind of more like a sort of clean brightness so play around with that and you'll you can mix up with color filters and time of day to sort of alter the images um, visual style and the time of day also is good for shadows so it's think of it like a big flash bulb and it will change how the shadows appear in your image and also we have weather weather is similar really you can use that in conjunction with filters time of day and play around with the color variations in the weather and also the ambient temperature because you have sunny days rainy days lightning cloud etc fog you know you can really create some interesting atmosphere in the images with these these features next option is animated environments so you can while you're taking pictures you can have all the environment animated then take your shot you don't need to turn the animation off you can also do a still video recording where you've got the photo but it's moving with the trees and the grass so what are the pros and cons of this? Well, the, the, the cons are that when you add leaves or there's leaves in the shot and it's animated, they're always going through the shot. And when you take a still, those leaves really don't look very good. They look very pixelated and rubbish. When you see them in motion, they look great. It looks like, wow, this looks really atmospheric. So for still video or for panning video, very nice to have the animation. However, when you're actually taking the photo, sometimes the animated elements will ruin the image by having lots of little bits of crap all over the shot. So I'd recommend stopping the animation if you're doing stills because you don't want lots of rubbish all over the image because they don't really look that good. When you look at the leaves still, they're not as, as detailed as you think. Then we have Gin Emotion, which to be honest, I think the variations they've added here are very poor. Like you really want some expression, but I guess Jin is a samurai, so you know they're not the most expressive people. They're more kind of like stoic and um, formal kind of warriors. So the facial expressions here, the emotions, I would say these are pretty bog standard, quite disappointing. Next we have helmet slash mask. So you can have them on or off, depending on if your character is even wearing a helmet or mask. So depends on the shot, depends on the image, depends whether you've got it on or not. So it's nice to have the option. Okay, last few, we've got cinema bars. Now these are good if you want to create a kind of like a mock uh, 16 by nine type of uh, cinema widescreen cinema shot. You know, if, you, if you've kind of been influenced by cinema in your photography and you want to create that kind of image, the bars are good. One thing I'd say is put the bars on first and then compose your image because obviously you're composing with a comp within a compressed frame. So framing when you've got the full screen visible and then putting the bars on, doesn't always work because you've got to have the, the bars are there and then you just frame within them. Then you'll have a more punchy image. Okay, we have stamps. So these are basically like PNG logos that you can put on the image if you want to create a, a type of like poster or something like that. So, you know, you can play around with it. I don't think there's, I don't think they really add much to it. So it's, it's like a superfluous feature, but it's there if you want to use it. And finally, you have music. Now, if you're a kind of a cinematographer and you want to create nice panning shots or motion stills, the music will help you kind of with the atmosphere. Obviously, I'm not going to feature that music on this video because copyright issues, but they've got about, oh, I don't know, five or six tracks there. There's a few and they're all quite nice. So play around with those. But, they, you know, they're only really if you're a kind of a budding director or a budding cinematographer and you want to add music and create like moving imagery. Okay, so that is the photo mode. As you can tell, it's got a lot of features there. In general, I think it's very, very good. I think it's got lots of cool, unique features. It's kind of, you know, it's got a lot of flashy features that will appeal to people that aren't particularly experts. So you can kind of make a very nice, beautiful, vibrant image with lots of cool effects without really much kind of knowledge of photography. So that like though it's good for a, a beginner, I would say this is a very good photo mode. 
However, it does lack a few things. It doesn't have any settings for vign vignetting, brightness, contrast, adding grain, color grading, sliders, etc., etc. So they've put a whole lot of stuff in here, but I do think there's a lot of room to add more features. So it's not perfect, but it is very cool. I'd say overall, I'd probably give it a 9.5 out of 10. If it added those other features, I think it would be a 10. You know, when you're, you know, compared to something like Days Gone, it doesn't have the broadness of features in terms of like professional photographers would use, but it has more kind of fun things like animation, you know, the particle effects and all those things. So if it added a bit more depth to the actual post-processing, like the color grading, the contrast, brightness, vignetting, etc., I think this would probably probably be the number one photo mode. But at the moment, I'd say it's 9.5. It's very good. I think it's very, you know, it's very easy for anyone to take a nice picture here because it all looks so gorgeous. So if you haven't tried it, I would definitely recommend the game. And the photo mode here is very good and it can get a little bit addictive. So, you know, maybe play the game first, then just go off on a photo jamboree. Okay, so that's the photo mode details. Now for the special topic, which is focus and depth of field. So they're kind of different things. So focus is obviously dictates what's the kind of soul identifying thing in the image that you want to focus on, whether it's a person, whether it's a building, some piece of action, something in the distance, whatever it is, an object. That is kind of really the first thing you'll notice. Like when you want to take a picture, you'll see something in the environment and that's drawn your attention. So that is your focal point, the focus. Once you have the focal points that you're focused on, then it's depth of field. Now, depth of field, really, what that really means is where is the focus area and how much of the area in the image is going to be in focus? Are you going to have like a very narrow strip in focus and everything else is blurry? Or are you going to have everything in the image clear, clear and in focus? Like when someone says a shallow depth of field, shallow depth of field means it's very narrow. So that would mean if there was a glass in front of me and some trees behind it, and I had a very shallow depth of field, I could focus on the glass, but the trees would all be blurry and just colors and shapes. If you were having a deep focus, it would be like a the entire thing would be, you know, the glass would be in focus, the table, the trees, everything would be clear. So how much depth of field you want it really dictates what you're trying to do. If you're trying to isolate one object in the image, using a kind of a shallow depth of field is useful because it emphasizes that object and it kind of blurs everything else out. You don't have to blur everything out to the point where it always just like washed out. Sometimes you just do a little bit and it just emphasizes the eye on the main subject just enough. But it, you know, some images, when you have everything in focus, it looks better. Sometimes it doesn't. It's really something you have to kind of um, just take individually with each shot because every photo is different. So you just have to look at each shot and like, okay, I like the background, but I don't really want to see it all in crisp clearness. So I'm just going to wash it out a little bit and it adds a bit of mystery. It adds a kind of nice kind of blurry color in the background. And then you have the sharp focus on what it is you're taking the picture of an object or a person. And you know, don't be afraid of the blur because the blur can have really nice effects. Like I would say I use the blur a lot when there's very vivid colors in the background, because when you wash that out with a blur, it kind of is this like sort of very vibrant kaleidoscope of color. And it's like, um, it's like a backdrop to a portrait. When you take a picture of a person, the person is the focal point, yes, but you have to think about the background because what's in the background will elevate or lower the quality of the image because if you've got something interesting as well and it's nicely composed with the person, it can really elevate a good image into a great image. And sometimes just that little bit of blur just kind of washes it out enough and just draws your eye from the background to the foreground to the character you're looking at. And that's really the key. You want to emphasize the focal point, what you're focusing on, and the depth of field will allow you to do that. I also like the kind of blurriness with silhouettes. Sometimes you can blur the main subject as well. Like sometimes you can have a completely blurry image if you want to create a very eerie and mysterious shot. Or you can have the focal point blurred with something else in the distance in focus. I use, sometimes that's something I use if, 
let's say I want to create a journey in the image. So there's like a castle in the distance that someone's going to. So I'll have the castle in focus and then progressively as we get to the subject, it kind of washes itself out. So then the main focal, like the main character will be like a silhouetted mysterious figure that you can't fully make out. And then you see the road to the castle and that progressively gets more clear. So that's and that's a kind of an inverted way of using focus if you don't want to use it in a conventional way. But it's really something you just have to try out for yourself and play around with. And don't be afraid of putting loads of blur. Don't be afraid of having it in, in terms of crystal clarity, no blur at all. Try both and see which ones work on different images because you'll be surprised. Sometimes you'll think, oh, I want to have a very blurry background on this one. But then you try complete open, wide open sort of aperture and it looks great. So don't be afraid to try both. So, but it's, it's, it's an important part of emphasizing the focal point, the subject matter, whatever it is you're trying to showcase. The depth of field is a tool you can use to really emphasize, overemphasize and, and elevate the overall feeling of that image. Okay, we're nearly done. Just a few questions from the virtual photography community. I've got four questions today. Thank you for sending them. Question one, how should I use black borders correctly on my photos? I want them to look more like a film still, but I never seem to get it right. Do you have any tips? Well, I touched on this earlier. What I would say is if you're going to use black borders, put them on immediately when you're taking the shot because then you're immediately forcing yourself to frame within the borders because you've got a very narrow strip there. So you just need to look at that and frame the image within the strip rather than frame it, then put the strip on because then you're just going to add more work to your image. And it's really about balance because obviously when you use black borders, what you're doing is you're creating a much wider shot. It's not really wider than the normal shot you do, but it seems wider because you've got these two black bars at the top and the bottom. So it's good for like panoramic, but you've also got, you know, you've got to frame it correctly and just position it correctly. So put the black borders on immediately and just frame it within that. That might help. Next question. I love combat shots, but always struggle with timing. What can I do to improve that? Well, combat shots are tricky because, you know, you never know exactly the moment you stop it. Is it going to work? Isn't it going to work? Really, there's no exact way of doing it. You just have to kind of know you're going to take the shot before you take it. So you see someone you want to have a fight with, you run into the situation, you press the attack button or whatever it is, and you're kind of almost preempting the moment and then bang, you, you pause it. And then you have a look at the photo mode. Now, you know, like you might do it 10 times and eight times out of 10, it looks crap. That's fine because with action, you're not dealing with a still image. You're dealing with a variable of movement and sometimes it doesn't look right. So, it's not something you can just nail on the first attempt. You're just going to have to try and try to get the right timing. You know, if you're not getting the right timing at the moment, maybe do it earlier than you're normally pressing it. Maybe do it a bit later or maybe just take your time a bit more rather than rush it. Or, you know, just um, practice combat shots without any enemies there. Like just use your sword in a field and pause the game at times where you think it's going to look good. And that might give you some sort of practice that you can help in, in, in regards to Ghost of Tsushima. Third question, I'm currently studying film and was wondering what games are best for practicing things like cinematography or moving images? Well, I'd say Ghost of Tsushima is good, but in terms of other ones, Mad Max is a great example because it's got a director mode and that is really user friendly and you can place the camera around you can have tracking shots, you can do all kinds of things with it. And that's a really, really good tool for budding cinematographers. GTA 5 has a director mode as well, which again, I think is very useful if you want to practice, like if you want to just do a sort of a shootout or a scene in the game, and then you want to go through it and compose the whole thing. Mad Max, you have to do it live. GTA, you can record the footage and then go in and edit it. So maybe GTA is the best for that. But Mad Max is worth a look. And also Ghost of Tsushima is kind of interesting with the movement, but it isn't like a director mode. It's just like a still with moving parts. Okay, final question. How can I give my photos more atmosphere or story? Well, it's a difficult one to answer that because it really depends what you're looking at. You know, like I would say that when you start out in photography, the images that you're taking are not going to be as good as the ones you're taking a year, 
two years, three years. What happens is you get better at capturing the moment, capturing the atmosphere, capturing the story. We all, I mean, we all have an instinct for atmosphere and a story and a moment. So we're like, there's the moment, stop, stop the action, let's take a photo. And it's really a combination of how you frame it, how you use the depth of field in terms of focus, how you color grade it, the effects, you know, lighting, etc. There isn't one thing I can say, do this and that will be better. Really, like a photo is many, many, many different things put into one object. It's like several pieces of a puzzle. You put it together in the right way and it feels better than it would have done individually. So take care when you're framing, take care when you're doing the depth of field, take care with the, the post processing because all of these things impact how much atmosphere you have in a shot. You can have the same shot done one way or another way. And one can have almost zero impact and one can have a huge amount of impact if it's just done in a way that captivates. And you can kind of tell that when you look at it yourself. But the more you do it, the better you'll be at kind of pinpointing what it exactly is that makes it more atmospheric or more story driven. OK, well, there you go. That is another episode. Episode three done. Ghost of Tsushima. Really nice photo mode. Um, we covered the special topic and the questions. If you've got any more questions, please feel free to tweet me. Uh, details are on the screen at the moment. I'm happy to help anybody if they've got any queries or questions. Um, I don't know what people want covered. So if you have anything you'd like me to cover in the next video, just let me know and I'll do my best to do that. But in the meantime, thank you for watching. Uh, I appreciate your support. I hope it's been informative and useful. Definitely check out Ghost of Tsushima's photo mode because it is one of the better ones. And I've definitely really enjoyed it. And hopefully these, uh, this video will help you take better pictures. This is Photography Gamer signing off. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you for watching. And I will be back with another episode in due course. Cheers. Cheers.